Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to your Reset Live Lectures. Dear friends, as you know that we have started a series on religion, society and culture and Indian history and today we, are, today we are conducting yet another lecture, the same series. In today's lecture, we will try to understand the concept of women in early Indian art. In this lecture, we will try to understand how women have been represented in visual arts in various stages of early Indian history. We will be talking about women in visual arts excluding the architecture. The various stages that we will be covering in this lecture would be uh, prehistory, pro uh, protohistoric and then Mauryan and post Mauryan and Gupta period. To discuss this topic we have with us our subject expert Dr. Neeraj Sahai. Dr. Sahai is associate professor in department of history in Sri Vaknateshwara College, University of Delhi. Without further ado, I would like to welcome sir to our studios and request him to start the lecture. Welcome sir. Thank you. Um, as has been already pointed out, uh, we are discussing women in early Indian art as part of the MOOC series lecture on religion, society and culture in Indian history. There are, there are certain issues that need to be said at the very outset as to why there is this need for understanding uh, women and why art has been chosen. Now if one looks at the objective, the various objectives that we have before us, the first one is that Social history has always been lopsided, where men have always been given historical agency and women have always been relegated to a brief discussion under culture. So this lecture seeks to address the imbalances in social history by creating space for women, understanding of women and also it endeavors to correct and look at the representation of women in art. Now, why art? Why art has been chosen? Production of art is always in a certain context and art is product of a certain age. When we say context, there are certain situations and these situations can be social, religious or political. Now it would be interesting to find out how these aspects attribute various roles to women and how their identities are created. As far as early India is concerned, early India has got a vast chronology and we will be looking at prehistory and protohistoric as the first stage. And the second stage where we look at early India, the historical period. Now, as far as early India is concerned, it is a large chronological hole. And we exclude architecture here for the simple reason that uh, architecture has already been engaged by one of our uh, subject expert Saurav Kumar who will address certain concerns regarding architecture. Now we look at this lecture in two parts and in the first part we basically deal with both the non-literate history as well as the literate history. Even though Harappan civilization may be considered as the literate history but the script has not been deciphered and our knowledge is largely reconstructed on the basis of archaeology. As far as archaeology is concerned, archaeology is a separate discipline and historians have to make use of the data, the tangible data presented by archaeologists. 
what we find is that as far as the second part of our lecture is concerned, we should effectively deal with Mauryan period and the aftermath of Mauryan period going all the way up to Gupta period and brief comments may be on uh, post Gupta centuries also. As far as the intermediate period is concerned, we find there is a long break in the presence of data. This is, high, this, this is very conspicuous that uh, there is, is a kind of hiatus and we do not find substantial data to talk about the intermediate phase. Now, it would be interesting to find out how the evidences are interpreted. Uh, evidences can be dealt with in the contemporary setting where we try to look at the context which has already been pointed out. The context could be religious, social, political and also there are certain modern readings. How the modern readings, the modern situations uh, influence the understanding of a remote past. So, all these things have to be taken into consideration. The first phase that we need to look into is uh, the Paleolithic period and in the Paleolithic period, we do not have very substantial evidences. One of the earliest evidences that we find is from Lohanda Nala and it is, it was a study of Robert G. Bednarik who suggested that a bone object which is dated to Upper Paleolithic, it may be roughly dated to a period of 25,000 to 1900 before present and this bone object which is damaged was found uh, in a uh, sediment coarse matrix gravel, it's called gravel 3 and initially this bone object was identified as mother goddess. Later on this was contested and V. S. Vakankar and Robert Bednarik they have themselves contested this and according to them, it could be a harpoon. Therefore, interpreting evidence is a difficult task and if the tangible data is not found in primary context, primary location, then it is even more difficult to understand this. The second important evidence that we have which tells us a bit on uh, the role of women comes from Bagor 1. Bagor 1 is a site in Madhya Pradesh which has yielded a sandstone rubble. This is a circular platform uh, with a diameter of say 85 centimeters and it is on this platform or in the vicinity that certain pieces of stone have been found. These stone pieces are of different color shades from red to brown and when these are put together, they form a triangle, a triangle of 15 centimeters high height. It's its width is 6.5 centimeters and it is equally thick. Now, this evidence may be dated to roughly 9000 to 8000 BC and it is on the basis of ethnographic study that one can understand the meaning of such an evidence. So, how to interpret this evidence? It is only on the basis of ethnographic evidence that one may talk about such practices being part of worship of a female principle or, uh, 
or connected with fertility and this is uh, common in the Kamur hills among the tribes like Kohls and Begas. In the Mesolithic period, we find that we have several evidences and these evidences from the point of view of visual art provide very interesting information. The rock paintings were first found by A. Carlyle in the district Mirjapur of Uttar Pradesh. They have also been found from various other sites and these sites are from Ladakh, Kashmir and Karnataka. As far as Vindian region is concerned, the sandstone hills in the Vindian region are home to a large number of rock shelters and this is where Bhimbetka is located. Bhimbetka was very ideal for habitation, having vegetation, water and animals in the vicinity. So for Mesolithic people, this was a very important location and it is in Bhimbetka that a rock art comes out very clearly. The large number of rock art is found in Bhimbetka only. Here as far as the representation of women are concerned in the rock art which deals with both the engravings as well as the paintings, we find that the men are drawn in stick kind of images, sketches, whereas women are supposed to be in more natural form. In form, in fact, they are supposed to be fuller and also women are seen in different kind of activities. This was a period marked by hunting gathering. So it's natural that women are also seen as part of hunting scenes. But women are also seen in cooking scenes. They are seen catching fishes and mice, cats, etc. They are also seen in honey collection or climbing, tree climbing. This was all part of gathering activities. Irwin Neumeyer's suggestions that sexual division of labor had already started in Mesolithic period may not find acceptance of many scholars and this appears to be very very subjective. Women in Mesolithic period especially in gathering scenes are supposed to be uh, taking a very passive role according to some scholars but then again this can be questioned. At least their participation is certain. Women have also been represented in the maternity, in the process of maternity. Women seen in advanced stages of pregnancy, women carrying fetuses have also been found and besides this women were also part of community or family scenes. As far as community scenes are concerned we can say that they are part of scenes where uh, some mourning is, process of mourning is going on or uh, family dining scene where you know women are represented. So there are various kind of scenes where women have been seen. As far as the functionality of both Paleolithic and Mesolithic are concerned, the representations 
were definitely part of a certain milieu and this functionality can be seen in the economic preoccupation which was hunting and gathering and the rituals and practices pertaining to hunting and gathering have been represented in the Mesolithic rock art. The next phase is marked by uh, is Neolithic. In fact, the evidences that we have profusely come from Mehargad and within Mehargad there are various phases that have been studied and it is not before the phase 4 of Mehargad which uh, we can date around say 5th millennium BC that the hybrid female figurines appear and there is gradual evolution and first they appear like vertical artifacts or the representation of women can be seen in terms of certain rods and these rods like tangible uh, these rods like you know uh, objects had small eyes and had pointed nose uh, then as far as breasts could be con were concerned they could be separately attached after phase 5 we find that uh, the seated female figurines appear and of course seated figurines uh, are, are easier for support and here we find that women are adorned with lot of jewelry especially in the neck around the neck area and then they had very elaborate hair dressing also. One thing is very important here that uh, as far as Mehargad is concerned, the context is very, very important. Mehargad comes across as a site which has been able to demonstrate how this part of the world had its own history of agriculture. Mehargad demonstrates the gradual evolution of agriculture and different kind of crafts and this may have started around 7th millennium BC onwards and we find agriculture implements and there are various indices which tell us about gradual growth of indigenous agriculture in South Asia. However, the label of mother goddess which is given to number of uh, number of pieces of art is somewhat oversimplified as it draws upon cultic significance. Fertility may have been very important in agriculture society but these could also be votive offerings or could be part of domestic rituals and if they were found within the shrine then one can understand the purpose of uh, these pieces of art. However, if they are not found within shrine then they could be at best some kind of uh, votive offerings. Also, uh, this brings us to the next stage which is by far the most important stage as far as uh, the early phase of Indian art is concerned. And Harappan civilization does provide us with diverse range of sources. We have seals and sculpture sculpture now only no, not only we have terracotta but we have bronze also the changing context of harappan civilization was also very important because this was the period which was marked by urbanism and the urbanism definitely had its basis in the development of agriculture granaries would not make much meaning if there is no agrarian surplus so 
control of agrarian surplus, control of rural area areas by uh, the urban areas, vast range of professionals, the exchange patterns, also evidences pertaining to art and architecture, development of technology. So, Harappan civilization was definitely a high point and it is in this context that one has to understand not only the diversity of sources, but also look at uh, the evidences of art. One of the earliest evidences that we find here is one of the seals. Uh, this seal represents a woman with outstretched legs and a plant issuing out of the middle of her body. This could be a forerunner of uh, Mother Earth and Shakambari, which is which was you know found in the later times, which pertains to Mother Earth, is uh, not out of context here because uh, in almost all the agricultural societies, fertility, maternity are important aspects, and these are represented in art. So, maternity has been at the center stage of discussion of Harappan religion and the cult of mother goddess that we have read overlooks the availability of diversity of evidences. Alexandra Janssen's work has shown how the diversity could be seen in the female figurines, terracotta figurines. There are various kind of terracotta figurines. There could be slim type representation of women or there could be matronly kind. As far as the slim types were concerned, they had elaborate fan shaped headgear, loin cloth covering the middle part of the body and having heavy ornamentation. Besides this, they also had appendage on the other side, on the other sides of the head, uh, which could be used for incense burning or for some other uh, purpose, as is seen in the black residue which is found in such female figurines. As far as the pot bellied, maternally kind women are concerned, we find that they are largely without clothes and have very little jewellery. Apart from these two, there could also be sculpture where the gender markings are not very clear. Uh, one may look at this image where the gender markings are not very, very clear. There are two factors that Alexandra Janssen talks about. One is the diversity of iconographical details and the second one is association of the supposed female mother goddess figurines with other scrap, scrap, sculptural artifacts. Now put together, they suggest that one has to look beyond the maternity and fertility complex. As far as the location is concerned, in Harappan civilization, we do not find expression of uh, polity or religion in monumentality. So, one has to look at uh, the muted nature of these aspects, the purpose of the terracotta figurines is also not very clear. These could be toys or uh, uh, these could be voting offerings or these could be used in domestic rituals. So, there are a variety of things uh, which are associated with these uh, so called mother goddess figurines.
this this image is of a uh, one can say that uh, maternity is very clear here is supposed to be uh, carrying a baby or uh, this this is actually not very clear uh, but uh, it has been interpreted as uh, carrying an infant this is uh, this for sure uh, demonstrates you know how mother is carrying an infant here the gender markings are not clear which we have already discussed uh, in harappan civilization we also get other artifacts which tell us uh, about representation of women a dancing girl uh, which is uh, um, one of the most discussed artifacts of this cultural artifacts of this period was found at mohanjodaro uh, in the hr area of mohanjodaro by ema sahani and it is all of 10.8 cm high and is cast in uh, bronze lost through lost wax method uh, as far as this uh, artifact is concerned uh, look let's look at you know this uh, picture this is a dancing girl here one find that uh, uh, she is slim is young and uh, the right hand is resting on the hip and uh, the fem- uh, the left is you know outstretched and uh, we also find that uh, she is wearing a necklace with uh, three distinct pendants then we have bangles on in the left hand she is wearing about 24 25 bangles on the right hand she has in the wrist area she has some four bangles and uh, near elbow she again has two bangles the hair is tied loosely into a bun now what is interesting about the label of this image sir john marshall called it a dancing girl and it was his understanding that uh, she represented a notch woman and this notch woman was supposed to be dancing to some beat uh, and there is unmistakable bend in the leg here one can see some kind of movement also what is surprising is the depiction of half impudent posture sir john marshall thought that um, uh, there is some kind of impudence which is typical of a notch girl or a dancing girl now this is very difficult to sustain and uh, that is why as we have discussed before interpretation is, can be very very subjective as far as art is concerned what is certain is that she appears to be a confident woman now this seal pertains to uh, proto shiva and is a steatite seal and it was discussed as part of egh mackay's report where uh, we we can find a yogic posture and uh, this uh, the central icon is surrounded by animals uh, now questions have been cast on the identification of the gender of of uh, proto shiva some even calling that uh, it could it could not have been lord of the beast it could have been lady of the beast and one can refer to subhangna atre uh, she discuss uh, she you know is cast question on uh, the masculinity of of this uh, icon however there is a larger consensus on the masculinity of the uh, central icon so uh, whether it was shiva or it whether it can be called as pashupati it's is difficult it's difficult to uh, ascertain this because uh, shiva develops as a cult much later much later in time we also find certain evidences on chalcolithic culture and these evidences have been uh, uh, given by dhavlika Uh, who brought out the study of inam gaon and navasa and suggests that uh, in the household context uh, domestic rituals one may find uh, that maternity is clear now just to wind up this uh, argument on the prehistory and proto historic phase 
one can say that uh, the evidence is not very profuse and it's only around Harappan period that one finds that there is a greater diversity of sources. Also, the context uh, changes from the Paleolithic period and Mesolithic period from hunting gathering stage to the stage of uh, to the stage of agriculture. And the location is very important because unless and until these artifacts are found in primary locations within some kind of shrine of obviously we do not have much evidence of um, uh, religiosity of structures uh, as far as Harappan civilization is concerned. Also, as we uh, uh, put it very clearly that Alexandra Jansen has questioned the diversity of terracotta figurines and the difficulties in accepting some kind of cult for the mother goddess. What is really interesting is that as far as the early tangible data was concerned, it was not only the context which was an important determinant, but uh, but the modern readings, when Sir John Marshall was trying to discuss certain things, he obviously had in mind the modern Hindu religion and he was trying to look for uh, some parallels in the remote uh, uh, tangible artifact that he found. section we will be looking at the women in uh, historical period, how they have been represented in the historical period. Uh, there appears to be a break between the Chalcolithic period and the modern period and unless until we have newer discoveries, newer findings, uh, it, uh, it would be understood that there was not much that was happening during this period as far as the visual art was concerned. During the modern period, there appears to be a kind of break or a, a hiatus as we have already discussed and it is only in the modern period that the situation clears up and we find that there is a revival of the art in the modern period in terms of the production of sculpture and also architecture. These may be related to the changing context and the changing context here was both political and religious. The presence of political sphere of Mauryans to almost a pan-Indian setting could have made a difference. Also, 
the restructuring of economy under the Mauryans and the efforts to build the entire subcontinent into some kind of an ideological setting may have had important bearing on both patronage as well as the nature of the art which is found. In the Mauryan period, as Nihar Ranjan Ray has suggested, the court art was the dominant art and this is a transition from Mauryan to post-Mauryan period where one can say that in the post-Mauryan centuries, the art went to the realm of different sections of the society and this had a important bearing on the endowment patterns. As far as the art of this period is concerned and especially the representation of women are concerned, there is not much that can be discussed. However, one may refer to the tradition of Sakya Simha. Sakya Simha basically means a line of the Sakyas and one of the examples of how elephant motive is seen can be seen in the representations of Maya's dream. In the Maya's dream, we find that uh, white elephant is seen when she conceived the future Buddha. The association of elephant with dream and conception can also be seen in the context of Trishala, mother of Mahavira, where again white elephant was seen in the dream. Besides this, we have uh, Yakchi and Yakchi was part of the popular religion and they are seen in variety of roles actually. They are seen as guard, as guarding a certain area. They are adorned on doors and there is lot of use in the later iconography as far as Yakshis are concerned. So let us look at the Didargang Yakshi sculpture. This is Maya's dream of white elephant. One can see, one can see elephant here. Elephant can be seen here and a similar uh, situation can also be seen in the context of Trishala, the mother of Mahavira. Now this is the Dargan Yakshi sculpture. The various issues concerning this sculpture, whether this was a Yakshi at all or was an attendant. As far as the iconographical details are concerned, one can look at the necklace here, the necklace and the headdress. She is also a chauri bearer, so it is seen in the right hand. And the treatment of body is uh, very important here. She is young, voluptuous and uh, it has been suggested that even chronology uh, can be questioned because uh, according to some scholars, uh, this appears to be post Mauryan and this could date to 1st BC to 2nd century AD. Now, as far as post Mauryan centuries are concerned, patronage was very, very important here and Nihar Ranjan Ray actually talks about uh, the royal art for the Mauryan period and in the post Mauryan period, we find that uh, this goes to the domain of various sections of the society 
beyond imperial control and this social situation could also be seen in the endowment pattern of this period. Uh, this was a new change and uh, we find that different sections of the society, various professionals were making endowments to religious complexes, to monasteries, uh, to shrines and uh, we find that women also uh, were part of these donors. As far as the dominant historiography is concerned, this period is seen as a period of urbanism and uh, this urbanism was at, at its peak during this period. So, we find that uh, as a result of this, uh, this, this, was, this was definitely a socio, uh, newer social economic categories unleashing of these forces and uh, they made important endowments. They were the ones who provided patronage. Postmodern centuries are also important in the sense that we have a development of a mainstream Hindu cults and in the pantheon of deities that we have, Gaj Lakshmi is very important, Durga is very important, they are found at various places including Mathura. This period was also important for representation of popular local cults and how these local cults of Yakchis and Nagis or Nagins, they were being assimilated in the mainstream Brahmanical deities. As far as Gajalakshmi was concerned, Gajalakshmi is found seated on lotus and surrounded by elephants on either sides and she is supposed to be goddess of prosperity. Durga is also seen in various forms. Uh, one of the evidences pertains to Mahisasur Mardini on uh, which is on a terracotta which is found in Rajasthan and this period uh, shows that from uh, Yakchis and Nagis also uh, they have diversity within you know these uh, deities also. They were popular deities had their own cults. Salabhanjikas which were associated with uh, with plants or sorry trees uh, were also seen in as part of Yakchis only of the pantheon of Yakchis. Then we have uh, other kind of sculpture especially from Saka Kushana complex where one finds Hariti and Panchika sculpture. Hariti is basically a goddess uh, which is concerned about her children. She has compassion, she is also protective of her children and uh, Panchika is the male deity and they are seen together. Uh, as far as the postmodern centuries were concerned, apart from uh, the mainstream Hindu goddesses like uh, Durga and Lakshmi, uh, we also find other artifacts which are found in uh, the votive, votive tank complexes and you know in association with water. So, uh, these were the important locations where one finds different kind of artifacts. This is uh, the picture uh, which depicts you know Durga with her attendants on a terracotta plaque. This has been found from Chandraketugad and this belongs to the Sunga period in 1st century BC. This is a typical Sali Bhanjika and this is found on Sanchi Stupa gateway. As far as postmodern art is concerned, in the postmodern art, relief art was very very important. Relief art is where the engraving is only on surface and can be seen from the front and this was also narrative in character in the sense that a lot of it does convey a lot of stories and uh, Maya's representation on Sanchi gateway uh, was initially thought to be of Gaj Lakshmi 
and uh, maya is also very very important part of buddhist iconography uh, sachi is also important because it tells us about the endowment pattern where women did play a very very important role upinder singh in study of uh, uh, sachi and the endowment patterns uh, has suggested that um, there were large number of women donors and in the carvings we find representation of different kind of women where you have uh, yakshis uh, you also have uh, salib salabhanjikas then there could be celestial women there could be towns women and besides this there could be women in community scenes uh, offering making offerings to the bodhi tree or in some kind of some bodhi scenes so uh, in a way upinder singh's work also confirms the nature of patronage uh, in the post modern centuries how different sections of society were making endowments and this was a big change from the modern period where uh, it was more to do with the royal patronage now post modern period is also important in the sense that different schools of sculpture did develop these were namely amravati mathura school of architecture uh, mathura school of sculpture and gandhara school of sculpture and this period was important for development of shakti on one hand and on the other hand we have a very mundane representation of women where the body becomes very very important there is a frank sensuousness which one can find and uh, these women are supposed to be very very uh, you know youthful and they are supposed to be uh, enjoying the mundane pleasures then we have uh, Uh, from nasik and on the wall of the viharas we have the mithuna figures which uh, actually tell us about development of a certain erotic art from the post modern centuries itself and uh, as far as the general terracotta sculpture art is concerned they are supposed to be representing sensuousness they make uh, important uh, understanding on uh, the dressing pattern the costume how this could be uh, very very translucent or uh, the headdress is very very important then they are also associated with fertility so these are uh, some of the uh, important features of the post modern sculpture this is a kushana period female figure from gandhara and one can look at the kind of costume and how uh, the costume is represented here this is in this scene one can find how a uh, women is uh, enjoying a very you know mundane pleasures and there is a frank sensuous sensuousness in this uh, sculpture as far as gupta period was concerned in the gupta period the most important aspect is the use of the label should we use the dynastic label at all for the gupta period because within gupta period one finds that they were Uh, different phases of development of sculpture and it was not an archaeological uh, in, uh, uh, it was not uh, one can say a chronological whole and there were different stages of development also the artistic refinement which one finds uh, during gupta period or under the centuries of gupta rule one can say it was part of a thought process where the development of brahmi from uh from uh, one can say geometry uh, from one can say 
to cursive or the transition to cursive also had its impact on on sculpture and there is some kind of refinement where in the art uh, artifacts also one finds there is a transition from geometric to cursive and this has been brought out beautifully by David Deringer uh, who suggests that how there was artistic refinement and there was a transition from uh, geometric to cursive and this was not only on uh, the finer grain stone but also or the finer surface but also in stone this becomes very very clear. H. Dani has suggested that there was a certain socio-political context in which such an art could be produced and this could be more true of the post Gupta centuries where we find that the luxurious patronage became very very important. Gupta period has been called a classical age whether we accept this label or question this label can be very very subjective as far as uh, the art is concerned and in the realm of literature one finds that there were definite advancements as far as art is concerned especially in sculpture uh, aspects like plasticity or linear rhythm can be clearly seen. The context of bhakti was very important here because bhakti did try to assimilate the popular religion and this period was also marked by ascendancy of Sanskrit where there was revival of Brahmanical culture and we find that the pantheon of Brahmanical deities develops. We find that uh, the emergence of Shiva uh, on a big scale and how Uma is represented as a consort of uh, Shiva. Then Durga is also seen in the various forms where uh, she could be an epitome of pacifism or she could also be uh, very very violent. So there are various shades of uh, Durga which can be seen in this period. Then Gajalakshmi which uh, along with Durga continues from an earlier period. And then we have as influence of uh, uh, Tantra religion, Tantricism we find that uh, the emergence of goddess Tara can also be seen in this period. So this is goddess Tara, one can say this is uh, goddess Tara. Now without discussion of paintings, it will not be possible to understand uh, the Gupta period and the art of uh, Gupta period, how women are represented. So this painting is from Ajanta where the consort of Bodhisattva can be seen, this is from cave 1 and one can uh, see how uh, the treatment of body is very very important here, there is frank sensuousness, uh, also the treatment of eyes and the movement, the movement, eyelashes, everything is so perfect in this period and uh, this was part of uh, the artistic refinement that they we were discussing. This is again uh, an Ajanta painting where a prince is seen with his wife and uh, one finds that uh, many of the paintings of Ajanta uh, are seen in black and you know the representation of women or the central figure could be uh, could represent nudity whereas the others would be fully clothed. This is again one of the masterpieces uh, which is of an Apsara uh, coming from cave 17 and here again the treatment of eye and the necklaces uh, adorned by her uh, and then you, we can find the jewellery and the movement. The movement of fingers is very very important here and very subtle movements can be seen in this period. Then we have uh, this terracotta plaque of Mahisasur Mardani which was also found in 
uh, found in excavation. Now, as far as the early medieval period is concerned, early medieval period ushered in a new phase of uh, sculpture and this was connected with a marked acceleration in temple building where more and more temples uh, were being constructed and here we find that not only we have uh, uh, Nagar, Nagar architecture, we also have Dravid and we have a uh, baser style of architecture on the temple walls, different uh, kind of uh, sculpture could be seen. Uh, this period is marked uh, for some developments. Uh, one was erotic art, uh, which could be related to uh, the context of feudalism, which was growing in this period, according to dominant historiography. This uh, post kutha centuries are marked by uh, development of feudalism. And uh, so feudal context could be one of the reasons why we have erotic art, or could there, there could be also influence of uh, tantra religion which could have played an important role in development of erotic art. Likewise, we have memorial stones uh, could be part of little tradition where we have various representation of women, violence being uh, perpetrated against, against women. Uh, SHR has done a lot of work on this uh, as far as uh, the region of Karnataka is concerned. So uh, this is one picture from Khajuraho. And this brings us to the end of our discussion uh, and how we see that there are different two, two different phases where uh, the sculpture can be seen and how the context was changing and uh, patronage of course was a very, very important factor. Maternity is something that continues from an earlier period and in the second phase, of course, religious art becomes much more profuse. Thank you. Dear friends, due to paucity of time, we have to stop our lecture here. On that note, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Kumar, Dr. Sahai to come to our show and deliver this lecture. And thank you, dear friends, for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.